From the Telesur headquarters in Caracas, Venezuela, welcome back to From the South. I am Luis de Jesus. Let's take a look at our headlines. At least 73 deaths and thousands of wounded after two huge explosions in the Lebanese capital of Beirut. Colombian Supreme Court ordered former President Álvaro Uribe Vélez to be placed under house arrest as a preventative measure for charges of alleged bribery and fraud against him. And Sri Lankans are set to vote in a parliamentary election this Wednesday. Actual president may consolidate his grip on power. And we begin with the news right away. Stay with us. And tens of deaths and thousands of wounded have left a huge explosion in the Lebanese capital of Beirut. From Lebanon, Wafika Ibrahim, correspondent of Al Mayanin, have the information. Just at six and seven minutes later, a big explosion broke out in the city of Beirut that shocked not only the capital but also several boarding provinces. There have been many rumors spread at first, speaking of an alleged terrorist attack whose target was former Prime Minister Saad Hariri. Others even spoke of the result from the international court related to the attack of the Prime Minister's father and former Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. However, Hariri quickly appeared and confirmed that he was well and that the explosion was not in that place, but the expensive way had a ranch around three kilometers or more. Security sources reported that the explosion was at port number two, dedicated to sterling imported fireworks for all Lebanon. But in addition, there was also a large amount of nitrate is turning that place and also side from some Americans who had imported this substance for the purpose of making fireworks. The primary information from the security sources and also from the direction of the port assured that there were maintenance works with iron wheels in a place near the warehouse of the key number two that caused a fire in a full tank which caused an explosion so huge that the Lebanese people recall the explosion in the assassination of former Prime Minister Rafik Hariri. But this shock wave was much wider. It is still able to see the fire and smoke at that last site. There was a lot of destruction and ambulances are picking up hundreds of wounded. It is speculated that there are thousands of wounded, but so far they speak of hundreds. And until the moment, there is not a total number of deaths. The surrounding seems to indicate a scenario of world war, buildings without electricity, lacks of fluent water throughout the balconies, also there are destroyed buildings. There are many civil defense forces, the Lebanese army and forces, also the number of ambulances are not enough for the number of wounded and people who are still asking for help at this time. These situations occurred in a country exhausted by an economic crisis and a collapse of banking in the country. In in addition to the rupture and suspension of imports, and now with the amount of destruction in the harbor, everyone is with a lot of concern that this situation will get more complicated. And thank you to Wafika Ibrahim for that information. And China's foreign ministry has described as a hostile action the decision of Trump's administration to take away the option to extend the visa to Chinese journalists, forcing them to leave the country. We have said many times that the cause and responsibility for the current situation lies within the U.S. The U.S. should immediately correct its mistake and stop its political oppression of Chinese media and journalists. If the U.S. insists on going its own way and continuing such wrongdoings, China will have to make necessary and legitimate responses to safeguard its legitimate rights and interests. China has also accused the United States of outright bullying over the popular video app TikTok after President Donald Trump ramped up pressure for the app to be sold to a U.S. company. For some time now, the U.S., without providing any evidence, has been using an abused concept of national security has been abusing its state power and has been unjustifiably suppressing certain non-U.S. companies. This goes against the principles of the market economy and the WTO's principles of openness, transparency and non-discrimination. 
It's outright bullying. China is firmly opposed to this. And the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson also made reference to European Union statements regarding elections in Hong Kong. I want to stress that Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China. The election of the Legislative Council of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region is a local election in China and is purely an internal matter of Hong Kong. No foreign government, organization or individual has the right or any reason to intervene. In another subject, Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez said his government respected the decisions of the royal household regarding the exile of former King Juan Carlos I. First of all, the government and I as president express our absolute respect for the decision taken by the royal household. We express this absolute respect in so far as what is behind the decision taken by the royal household, which is to distance itself from allegedly questionable and reprehensible behavior by a member of the royal household. Institutions aren't judged. People are. In this case, Don Juan Carlos has clearly said that he is at the disposal of justice if necessary like any other Spaniard. And French authorities have evacuated around 1,200 people on Tuesday in the coastal district of Martigues because of the violent fires registered in the last hours. Those evacuated, among them various tourists from, the, from their grown campsites, were moved in boats and buses to gyms where they were to spend the night. Meanwhile, 1,200 firefighters, along with six Canada airplanes, have attended to control the fires that had already ravaged several hundred hectares of vegetation. At first, you could see the flames in the distance, and then more and more it was getting closer and closer. And then we saw flames that were 50 meters away from the house. There were flames 20 meters high. We have to go now to a short break. Follow us in Twitter at Telesur English and Luis Telesur. We'll be right back. The Colombian Supreme Court has ordered that former President Álvaro Uribe Vélez be placed under house arrest as a preventative measure for alleged bribery and procedural fraud. The ongoing case against Uribe is one of the most important of recent years in Colombia. More than 7,000 testimonies have been anal analyzed as part of the process. The ruling must be notified immediately and comes into effect this Tuesday. The Uribe case will be discussed again next Thursday, although the judges could call another extraordinary meeting. The former president allegedly tried to manipulate the testimony of Juan Guillermo Monsalve, who was the founder of a, of a paramilitary group called Bloque Metro. And several Colombian political figures have expressed their support for the Supreme Court's decision regarding Senator Álvaro Uribe. Colombian Congressman Ivan Cepeda, for example, called on current Colombian President Ivan Duque not to interfere with the decision and judges' deliberations over the alleged charges. Likewise, former mayor of the city of Bogotá, Gustavo Petro, urged President Duque to respect the Colombian justice system. Meanwhile, former Colombian Minister for Employment Clara López Obregón welcomed the move, noting the determination of the Supreme Court to apply criminal law impartially. Also, Colombian analyst and specialist on peace issues, Carlos Medina, has stressed that the house arrest of former Colombian president is not linked to the many serious criminal accusations leveled against him during his presidential term. Este, uh... This sentence comes mainly due to a charge of bribery of witnesses, fabrication and obstruction of justice, and for the orders against Congressman Ivan Cepeda, which are now reversed by the Supreme Court, and which placed President Uribe in the situation in which he is now. The proceedings leading to his imprisonment are not the process regarding links to drug trafficking, paramilitaries, and false positives, and all those criminal acts. Rather, this is a process on witness tampering, procedural fraud, and bribery. For that matter, Venezuelan President Nicolás Maduro spoke out in relation to the house arrest of former Colombian President Álvaro Uribe Vélez, accused of procedural fraud and bribery. The government of Colombia is in the hands of the mafia. 
Today, the Supreme Court of Colombia ordered a house arrest rather than jail for former President Álvaro Uribe Vélez, alias El Matarife, precisely because of his direct links to paramilitarism. As in the case of Al Capone, he is being held for a so-called minor offense, but not the many years of drug trafficking, so many accusations, so much evidence against Álvaro Uribe Vélez of having been the key element for Pablo Escobar Gaviria. In Bolivia, tensions are growing on the second day of a general strike called, the, called to reject the postponement of the elections with mobilizations and roadblocks reported in different regions of the country. Further acts of police repression of protesters have been reported. A camp was set up close to the Supreme Electoral Tribunal in La Paz, where several young people began a hunger strike to call for the general elections to be held on the previously agreed date of September 6th. The protest was abruptly dismantled by police forces and several demonstrators were, ar were arrested. Likewise, in the town of Santa Rosa de Roca, one of the many road barricades set up nationwide was violently removed by security forces with reports that some protesters were wounded. On Tuesday, Argentina's Ministry of Economy announced that it had reached an agreement with three major creditors to restructure $66 billion in debt. Argentina's formal offer submitted to the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission contemplates the payment of $53 for every $100 of debt, improving payment terms. The government said that the deal will, all, will allow members of the creditor groups and other bondholders to support Argentina's debt restructuring proposal and grant significant debt relief. President Alberto Fernández noted on his Twitter account that the country had secured a solution to tackle its impossible debt obligations in the midst of the economic crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. Argentinian citizens have welcomed the agreement on the restructuring of foreign debt, expressing hope that the economy can recover. Hopefully that deal will come into force. Hopefully they will accept the conditions to finish with a debt that nobody wants, that we have inherited from an absolutely corrupt and perverse government. If the government has an economic plan now, I suppose we will see it. Let's hope in the short term, hopefully, this will help the government to reactivate something. The deal is governed by the current circumstances, not the circumstances four months ago. So I think things will be more diplomatic and will be better understood, and there will be a better deal to pay the debt. And the government of the Dominican Republic reported more than 1,100 new cases of infection with COVID-19. This and other news from the Caribbean with our correspondent in Santo Domingo, Daisy Toussaint. With regard to COVID-19 in the Caribbean, Dominican Republic reported on Tuesday 1,178 new cases of coronavirus in the last 24 hours and 30 deaths. Thus, it's among 74,295 contagions and 1,213 deaths. The country continues in a state of emergency due to an increase in the spread of the virus days after the holding of general elections. The government has distributed 10 million masks to the population since the beginning of the pandemic as part of a campaign of sensibilization. Heidi, for its part, amounted on Tuesday 7,511 cases, of which 166 have died and more than 60% have recovered. One of the members of the Scientific Commission in Assistance of the Pandemic has said that a second wave is expected for the second week of August, followed by a Budo festival held in different regions in the past weeks. Moving to Puerto Rico, the the country records a new death for a total of 237 deaths between confirmed and probable COVID-19 patients and the number of confirmed cases is 19,324 infected between confirmed with PCR tests and possible infected. Meanwhile, in Jamaica, the country reported on Tuesday morning an increase in cases of hospitalization of patients with COVID-19 while identifying in the last 24 hours 11 
seven new infections of the virus. According to the Ministry of Health and Welfare, the total number registered of infections is 905, of which 743 have recovered and 12 have died. Thank you, Daisy Tucson, for that report from Santo Domingo Republican, Dominican Republic, I should say. And the government of Nicaragua awarded to Telesur the Order of Cultural Independence Rubén Darío in the framework of the anniversary of the TV channel. Nicaraguan Vice President Rosario Murillo granted the Rubén Darío Cultural Independence Recognition to Telesur, marking the 15th anniversary of the multi-state channel. Murillo pointed out that the multi-platform of news is a living and prodigious expression of combative and always victorious peoples in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Mi nombre es Florencia Guimarães García, soy activista travesti, vivo en Argentina y quiero en esta ocasión saludar por los 15 años de Telesur, por estos 15 años informándonos, informando al mundo sobre lo que el imperialismo quiere ocultar. 15 años revolucionando los medios hegemónicos de comunicación. Saludar y agradecer por replicar siempre las voces del colectivo LGTBIQ+. Un abrazo enorme, fuerte y revolucionario. Furia travesti y hasta la victoria siempre. We are back with more news. Sri Lankans are set to vote in a parliamentary election in which President Gotabaya Rajapaksa is facing a fractured opposition. It is widely expected for him to consolidate his power, a result rights groups warn could lead to deepening authoritarianism in the island. More than 16 million voters are eligible to go to the polls when they open at 7 a.m. local time on Wednesday with Parliament's 196 directly elected seats in 22 multi-member districts of up for grabs. Parliament's remaining 29 seats will be filled with uh, bi-proportional representation based on the results of Wednesday's poll. And in the Independent Electoral Commission of Ivory Coast announced on Tuesday that over 900,000 new voters have been registered on the electoral roll while highlighting there is no reason to postpone the general elections set for October this year. We finally got, after due processing, processing that consisted of actually checking whether the people on the voters list merit being there and meet the conditions. So in the end, we got 1,647,693. There are 904,956 new voters on the electoral roll, up from 277,956 new voters in 2018. As things stand, the election will not be postponed. There is no reason to postpone the election. We said that in our timeline, we had the revision of the electoral register, and the law says that electoral register must be revised and posted three months in advance. That is what we did. And then it takes 45 days, two months, to receive the nomination papers. That's what we're doing. And as presidential elections continues in Belarus, President Alexander Lukashenko gave his annual address on the state of the nation. Voters who were unable to travel to polling stations during Sunday's election have been allowed to cast their ballot between 4 and 8 of August. President Lukashenko said his government will continue to give priority to safety labor rights, national investment and health action against COVID-19. In his speech, the head of state assured a close alliance with Russia despite the latest tensions over the detention of alleged Russian military in the territory. 
He also highlighted the historical ties with neighboring countries and reflected a series of social measures that will mark the agenda as a candidate for new re-election. Russia has always been and will remain our close ally, irrespective of who takes power in Belarus or Russia. This is an irreversible factor. It sits deeply in our nations, despite that Russia has shifted from brotherly to partner-like relations with us. They shouldn't have done that. He is a well-experienced politician. This is not the first election he has held. He is right that brotherly relations between the two countries are not subject of conjectural intent interest. They have a solid basement of historical ties and modern pragmatic cooperation. As for the Russian detainee in Belarus, post blame hasn't been proved. And as for this theoretical performance that has been made around it, we will stand up for them and minds know as well. Thousands of Indian troops have imposed a curfew with razor wire and steel barricades in Kashmir on Tuesday, before the first anniversary of India's abolition of the region's special status. Prime Minister Narendra Modi stripped the region of its autonomy on August 5, 2019, promising peace and prosperity after three decades of violence that saw tens of thousands of people killed in an anti-India uprising. Officials announced a two-day curfew on Monday, claiming that intelligence reports indicated protests were planned in the Muslim-majority region of 7 million people. Locals have called for the anniversary to be marked as a Black Day. Police vehicles patrol after dark on Monday and again on Tuesday morning, with officers using mega megaphones to order residents to remain indoors. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the rise of the dollar against the Congolese franc is causing prices to soar, hitting consumers' purchasing power. The central bank set this rate, which caused the dollar to fall instantly. The dollar was at 20,000 Congolese francs, then suddenly dropped to 60,000 Congolese francs. I don't know whether to be satisfied with that or not. It's beyond us. Quite frankly, the government should have first considered lowering the price of products on the market instead of lowering the dollar directly. That is that what concerns us right now. The pandemic has seriously affected the economies of countries that have trade relations with the Democratic Republic of the Congo. A 40% reduction in exports, a 30% reduction in imports, the result is a deficit in our trade balance. In other words, our country earns less foreign currency than it did before the pandemic. And with that, we've come to the end of this news brief. Remember that you can find this and many other stories at our website at telesurenglish.net. And you can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Luis de Jesus. Thank you for watching. Hola, soy Estela Carlotto, presidenta de Abuelas de Plaza de Mayo y en nombre de la institución que presido y todos los que colaboran con nosotros quiero manifestar primero que Telesur nació hace 15 años y nos ha brindado y nos siguen brindando toda la información creíble, cierta y necesaria. Los felicito, sigamos juntos, estamos en un momento malo pero va a venir el bueno y podremos darnos el abrazo tan deseado. Muchas, muchas felicidades.